Welcome and thank you for joining us. I'm Suzanne Godby Inglesby, Associate Director of Indiana University's Institute for Advanced Study. Welcome to today's Research and Repositories webinar, continuing our theme of looking at memory in archives, libraries, and museums. Before we get started, the Indiana University Institute for Advanced Study recognizes that Indiana University is built on the ancestral homelands and resources of the Miami, Delaware, Potawatomi, and Shawnee people. We acknowledge and honor these indigenous communities, both past and present. For additional information about this land, I suggest looking at the Indigenize Indiana page on the IU First Nations Educational and Cultural Center website. Today, we're pleased to have Dr. Jose Carlos de la Puente joining us to speak on the topic of Customs Apart, Competing Land Claims Among Commoner Women in Colonial Indian Villages. That presentation will begin in just a moment. The format of today's presentation will be a talk by our guest, followed by a question and answer period. All who are joining us today live have the opportunity to put their questions or comments in the question and answer section that you should find hopefully at the bottom of your Zoom window. And I will share those with our presenter um, and give him a chance to respond to those. This talk will be recorded and available later for access as well. If you would like to find out about more similar talks to this, please email us at IAS at indiana.edu and request to be added to our email list. Jose Carlos de la Puente is an associate professor of history at Texas State University and a scholar of native Indian peoples and the Spanish empire. He focuses particularly on the formation of colonial indigenous legal, political, and literate cultures. His scholarship contributes to knowledge about native accounting technologies, the colonial Inca nobility, indigenous intellectuals and intermediaries, and colonial systems of land tenure and territorial representation. Dr. De La Fuente is currently a repository research fellow of Indiana University's Institute for Advanced Study and is conducting research in Latin American manuscripts collections at the Lilly Library. Today, he's going to talk with us about that work in progress. Our thanks to our colleagues at the Lilly Library, both for hosting Dr. De La Puente and facilitating his research, and for partnering with us for this webinar so that materials from the collection may be shared during the talk. Thanks also to IAS coordinator Elizabeth Khan for setting up this webinar and managing the behind the scenes tech on our end. So it's my pleasure now to turn the program over to our guest speaker. Welcome, Jose Carlos. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you very much, Suzanne, for the uh, introduction. I, of course, want to start by uh, thanking you know, the Institute for Advanced Study, as well as the Lilly Library, for the opportunity to be here in Bloomington, really doing what I, what I love the most. <laughs> and uh, this is especially after almost three years where, you know, visiting a library or an archive uh, was difficult, if not impossible. So everyone's been pretty great here, and I'm, I am Deeply thankful for that. Now, as you uh, as you mentioned, Suzanne, today I would like to uh, talk about the importance, right, of some of the uh, materials, the manuscripts uh, held at the Lilly for my ongoing research on commoners and land tenure patterns in indigenous villages of the Central and Indian region during the colonial colonial period. I'm going to start by sharing. My screen with you, so well, we can all get on the same page. Um, a minute. All right, there we go. <clears throat> uh, as uh, Susan mentioned, the, the, the title of my talk is Customs Apart, which is, of course, a spin off on you know, uh, E.P. Thompson's famous you know, uh, uh, Customs in Common, right? Competing land claims among common women in colonial Andean villages. Um, give me a minute, I'm going to switch cameras here. The show is on the camera here. I'm just going to show you something very neat. All right. So, uh, back in uh, 2017, I first came across the document that you see on your screen. I was here on a Mendel uh, fellowship for a few days and I stumbled upon this dossier uh, that say for the region uh, it originally came from in which at that point I was 
vaguely interested in the document did not catch much of my attention uh, initially. Now, as the original cover that you see here, right, announces, this is a court case, right? The autos, right? The legal proceedings, right? It's a court case um, in which several men whose names you see here, Francisco Aguilar and Pedro, uh, Acevedo and others, all relatives and members of Ayutarta. You're gonna hear me say this, this, this word a few times during the talk, Ayu, right? It's a Quechua noun that um, can be translated as, I mean, it means both kinship and kindred, right? So uh, archeologists, anthropologists, historians like to translate Ayu as sort of corporate descent group, right? It's a group of descent. So members of Ayutarta, who lived in a village uh, named Caranya at the beginning of the 18th century were suing members of another Ayu, Ayu Koyana. This is the one that appears here at the bottom, right? So it's these guys versus these guys, right? They were suing Ayu Koyana, another of the descent groups living in the village over some lands. The case was tried before Lima's High Court of Appeal. And on first impression, right, it really did not look that different from 100 similar, you know, 100 similar cases I have seen and studied in uh, Peru and Spain. Now, before we proceed, I need to yet again switch cameras here to show a little bit of the setting, right, so that Again, we can all get on the same page. So share screen, I'm gonna go back to my presentation. There we go. So this is gonna help you visualize, right? Picture the kind of place we're talking about. This is a modern view, right, of Caranya, right? The village in which uh, all these two IUs recited. Caranya is right there, right? Circled in red. It's a village that sits at more than 12,000 feet above sea level, right? Sort of nested in this very narrow ravine. There's a river that cuts across, right? A tributary of a much larger uh, river in uh, uh, the, the, the Cañete River that runs east-west, right? Into the Pacific. But villages like Carania, right? As I, uh, it's, I mean, it's very typical for them to be sitting in these, again, very narrow ravines where land by definition is very scarce, right? People in Carania today still work some of these fields, but you can start to sort of envision the amount of work that goes into turning this type of landscape, right? Um, into, you know, productive, productive land. So, um, as I said, the document didn't really touch my attention at first, but once I passed the opening, um, statements, which I'm gonna show you here. Right? These are some of the opening statements, petitions to the court, uh, some of the lawyers, you know, jargon, and even the uh, judicial decrees, right, that the uh, high court um, issued. These much older pages, in its view. This is a decree. And then here you can see, right? Okay, this is a bit torn, but then I stumbled upon, upon these older pages. I'm gonna zoom in here so you can take a quick look at that. Uh, while initially difficult to read due to the uh, kind of basic and broken Spanish of the indigenous scribe who produced them, they revealed to me not the story of the men who appeared you know, on the cover, but that of a woman, a widow. Maria Jamarca was her name. You can see here her name opening the petition, the, the petition Maria Jamarca, India Viuda, right? With, uh, 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 indigenous uh, widow. Um, and in March of 1645, she had filed a complaint against 
male heads of yet another Ayu, a third Ayu, living in Caranya, Ayu Chakayongo, whose members stood accused by Maria of taking possession of her maize plots by casting communal seed on them. The image that I have uh, in the um, cover of my presentation, go back real quick, I think it's gonna give you an idea of the scene here, right? There's a drawing by Felipe Guadalampoma, the, the famous indigenous chronicler, created sometime around 1615. And you can see here two, two women and a man, right? Uh, uh, planting uh, maize, maize seed. So she had filed, right, uh, this complaint on March 1645, accusing this uh, other IU of um, taking possession of her, her fields. An interesting detail is that in her complaint, she mentions her, she uses the word rayas in Spanish, right? Which means both sort of strips and um, furrows, right? You see this grid here that separated these small plots, right? From one another. So you can again sort of envision Maria working these fields, right? For a few years and then uh, the people of Chapayongo Ayu sort of casting the seed and uh, taking over her lands. Maria had no other means to support her two children. And she besieged the municipal court in Carania to uphold the family rights to the plots. For Maria claimed to have inherited them from her husband and he from his own ancestors. While she won her case and appeal in the municipal court, she could not really prevent the two IUs from, uh, there was yet another one involved later on in the story, right? Uh, her husband's IU, right? She could not prevent the two IUs from recommoning these lands and ultimately dispossessing her. Now, I am uh, here today not to talk about Maria. Those who are interested, um, I um, offer a, a more detailed analysis of the case in uh, a piece, in you know, an article that came out in the Hispanic American Historical Review uh, year last. So to those of you interested in following Maria's story, I will refer you to, these, to this particular piece. Instead, I wanna bring your attention today to a couple of points, right? Let me go back here to my uh, uh, other camera. All right. So a couple of points I wanna make uh, about this, right? First, Maria's court case, right? Which is only a few pages long, really, right? You can see here. Right here. And that's it, right? The case was literally attached, almost cut in to the larger dossier, right, of 1713. Um, so much so that its pages appear in between those of Lima's High Court of Appeals order to initiate an investigation in, you know, the larger case of Ayu Tarka versus Ayu Koyana. Second, the purpose of doing this was to document possession on the land, of the lands under dispute since at least the time of Maria Famarca, right? The mid 17th century. Keep in mind that some 70 years mediated between the two cases. A descendant of Maria, right? Had sold, ultimately sold Maria's family plots to Ayu Tarka. And now its members claimed them as their own, right? So therefore the need to include Maria's case, which I just showed you, uh, that, you know, for all intents and purposes, acted as Ayutaka's titles or deeds, right, to the lands in question. The third point I want to make is that Maria's brief court case, filed before Carania's municipal court, as I mentioned, is extremely rare, literally one of a handful of extant cases tried by these indigenous municipal councils. And when I say a handful, I literally mean fewer than five. I know of, of or that scholars have published about. The reason why these documents are so scarce, right? So, so scarce uh, 
I'll be happy to discuss in the Q&A. Fourth point, the dossier included not just one, but actually two or even three cases, right, of this sort, depending on how you count. So this is really a remarkable document in terms of, you know, uh, not so much, again, the litigation before the high court, but these other proceedings that were inserted, right, at different times uh, uh, of the court case. Other municipal complainants, uh, complaints, sorry, all initiated by women had been included later in the 1713 court case to act, right, as, as deeds to lands that these two IUs sought in 1713. In one of them, in fact, our very Maria Jamarca resurfaced again, claiming rights over a house and the adjacent orchard, as I'm going to discuss later, right, but only to be defeated by two other women in the village. Needless to say then, the Lily document has been instrumental for unlocking that uh, the, the Andean colonial commons, right? And for understanding land management, the family and local levels, as well as the role of women in disputes over land. For those interested in customs of commoning and how Maria Jamarca's uh, case helps us problematize static views of land tenure, right, sort of lingering in this false opposition between individual and collective, I refer you again to that uh, uh, piece from 2021. Today, we can ask ourselves, what would happen if we were to put these materials in conversation with the other two municipal cases involving women that I have been able to locate in other archives? In particular, I want to explore with you what they tell us about inheritance and competing land claims among commoner women in these colonial Andean villages. I want to let the documents speak, but before I want to men before that, I want to mention four, maybe five key points so that you can see how these documents challenge previous interpretations about the subject and also how I position myself and my research, right, vis-a-vis -vis, um, uh, the earlier works who have looked at women and inheritance, right, in uh, uh, colonial rural settings, right, Kania and, and uh, other parts of the Central Andes. All right, so first the agreement, right, where I agree with uh, previous scholars. A general increase in the production circulation and judicial deployment of these titulos or deeds, right? Uh, wills, certified lists of plots, fragments of land inspections, and writs of protection and possession by indigenous commoners at the turn of the 16th century is indeed borne out in these municipal lawsuits, right? So again, here is where I find myself in agreement with earlier scholars. However, there's always a however in history, right? The information is far from conclusive regarding one of the fundamental premises of previous interpretations, to wit, the allegedly widespread pre-Hispanic practice of parallel descent and transmission from mothers to daughters, from fathers to sons, of lands, herds, and other resources, and this is important, it's subsequent erosion, right, after the Spanish conquest, its replacement with uh, allegedly, right, um, patrilineal and ultimately uh, patriarchal, right, a norms of inheritance that supposedly, right, got rid of that earlier system of parallel uh, descent and transmission. Second point, all the court cases that I have located thus far involve women as formal plaintiffs and defendants. This significant level of female involvement, involvement in surviving intra-village quarrels, perhaps triggered by the right of widows and single women to file lawsuits independently, suggests that litigating before the municipal court to create or to strengthen a property deed was a gendered legal strategy, right, in itself, particularly effective for women. And this is important because previous interpretations had claimed that the introduction, right, of Spanish or Iberian norms of primogeniture, or, you know, patrilineal descent uh, had allowed men, right, to dispossess women of their lands. 
here we see in a much more complex picture. Third, talking about laws, no metropolitan or vice regal law, let alone Spanish or Iberian, governed these highly localized transfers of land rights among native common or households. Thus, I argue, this was not a, quote, Spanish law versus Andean custom scenario, wherein the former only, quote, worked to women's disadvantage, end of quote. These court cases, these court rulings were entered into not by Spanish justices in some distant vice regal capital, but by indigenous municipal magistrates endowed with what, you know, E.P. Thompson again called customary consciousness, right? Uh, bent on adjudication rather than application of the law. Final point, gender inheritance rules were not absolute, but neither were land deeds for that matter. Transmission rights were enmeshed in complex rules and strategies of IU and community. Our female protagonists were all commoners, not just in terms of being commoner indigenous women, right? Indias del Comun, as opposed to elite noble women, for instance, right? But in a much deeper sense that to varying degrees, their livelihood and treated obligations depended on customs of commoning of available resources. So their individual rights were, the, were inextricably linked to those of the women and men with whom they come. So to support these four general claims and to add some texture and nuance to this discussion, I will, as I said, let the document speak. My main contention throughout will be that while IU norms dictated that extended family states be held in common, right, serving as the basic model for a larger group, Patriarchal notions and tendencies generally informed Andean land tenure and inheritance before and after the conquest. Thus, the adoption of property deeds, a byproduct of the spread of literacy in these villages, and their deployment within these very elastic right, municipal jurisdictions, where old and new modes of arguing legal possession carried weight, helped some women upset established gender dynamics and offset the inequalities arising from these generalized customs of male-dominated particle inheritance, which placed daughters and wives at a disadvantage and pitted them against one another. So let's just jump into uh, the next case I want to present from the same manuscript here. I'm going to move the pages further in the document. And you're going to see what another petition here. Okay, soon. All right. So, what is this about? On May 19th, 1634, two sisters appeared before the municipal judge in Karani, a village of some 450 inhabitants, this time to reclaim their inheritance from another woman. This is the initial, the opening petition right in front of me. Catalina Aiko and Angelina Panca, the sisters in question, handed in a, a signed petition written in broken Castilian that described these assets as one fourth of a house lot, the house itself, and its adjoining farmlands, chacas. And deterred by the absence of a written deed that would prove possession, right? The two sisters proceeded to create one, entering their own testimony into the legal record. Catalina and Angelina, the sisters, traced the ownership of the house back to their grandfather, Don Sebastián Cajahuay, a prominent figure described in later, do later documents as the head of an ayu, we would assume the sisters own ayu, right? Whose possessions, houses, house plots, uh, farmlands, had been confirmed time and again since Inca times. In the women's rendering of the family tree, Don Sebastián had two sons, Felipe, the oldest, and Sebastián. Felipe had no issue, while Sebastián had at least one daughter named Maria, who was Catalina and Angelina's mother. Since no heirs on their uncle's side existed, the sisters argued the assets belonged to them as next of kin. Only one person stood in their way, however. That was Felipe's, right, the uncle's widow, Catalina Uchu. The, the sister's petitioned the magistrate to take the widow's statement 
and offered to summon their own witnesses that would further substantiate their claims. To establish who had the better claim, the magistrate consulted a written record, perhaps a parish book, a few days later, confirming that Catalina Uchu, the widow, right, the, the uncle's widow and the defendant in the case, had no son or daughter, and that Felipe, right, had no other heir. Moreover, on May 25th, he ordered a municipal scribe to formally notify Catalina Uchu of the impending ruling against her. The widow replied, perhaps with some resignation, quote, it is true, the house and chakra, right, of the, the plots, is theirs. Likely an elderly woman by then, she was either unwilling or unable to fight the decision. The investigation ended and the proceedings were handed to the claimants who stored their newly created D, the sisters, until 11 years later, they were forced to exhibit it again. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. Several aspects of this brief petition, the one again that you have here in front of you, right, and the accompanying uh, investigation uh, and municipal ruling stand out. Let me zoom out. First, Though Felipe's widow, Catalina Uchu, had been living in the house for quite some time, apparently the claimant's mother's, uh, with the claimant's mother's authorization, her grandnieces, right, the plaintiffs, did not consider Catalina a legitimate heir to her husband's share of the family estate, only a precarious occupant. The word charity is included in the petition's last paragraph. Over here. Right, this is the original petition. Um, but the unclear syntax makes it hard to determine whether the claimants were applying it to themselves, thus beseeching the judge to turn the house over to them, or most likely presenting it as the reason for their having let their aunt occupy the property until then. Second, all the witnesses summoned by Catalina and Angelina were elderly women from the village. But that, um, the witnesses in the Carania case agreed, these witnesses, with the patrilineal logic behind the sister's initial claim. Ranging from 68 to 90 years of age, all of them testified the same day of the, the petition was filed. You can see their statements here, right? Um, their statements were, were consistent helping the sisters establish an unbroken chain of ownership and inheritance that began with their maternal great-grandfather. They accurately listed the line of descent linking the women to Don Sebastián the Elder via Sebastián the Younger and his daughter Maria, emphasizing that all were legitimate sons and daughters. The witnesses, doñas who could sign their names, but also illiterate women of lower status, added a detail that bears mentioning because it seemed important to them. The house had two rooms and a kitchen to be shared, presumably, by the two sisters. It is likely then that theirs and the witnesses were all female-headed households. At first sight then, all the women involved in the case, the plaintiffs, the widow, and the witnesses, aligned themselves with the primogeniture and male preference within rules of party of inheritance. They made Catalina and Angelina's rights contingent on, first, the absence of heirs of Don Sebastián's firstborn son, and second, on their having inherited it from their mother only because their maternal grandfather left no male heirs with a better right. Upon further analysis, the uh, apparent strength of these claims hid its weakness. Although the house and the quarter lot had passed undivided to the brothers Felipe and Sebastian in the first generation and to the latter's descendants on the second and third, all heir parents were now women. The possibility of a male collateral relative alleging possession of these assets despite legitimate inheritance claims loomed large, likely justifying the creation of the 1634 title in the first place. Well, this is precisely what happened 10 years later when on January the 5th, 1644, the two sisters were forced to journey to Lima and appear before the Viceroy in High Court of Appeal to present their titles and plead their case anew. Although their grandfather had left no heirs but then, they argued, 
quote, with a strong hand and without any right, an Indio, right, an indigenous male named Diego Cajahuarco had taken advantage of their being, quote, poor and helpless Indias, end of quote, and was forcing them out of the house and surrounding blocks. Although litigants did not explain their kin ties to Diego, he was clearly a relative for, an, for other documents cast him as a direct descendant of Don Sebastián Cajahuarco the Elder, right, the sister's great grandfather. The family tree then was certainly bigger than the original claimants have made it out to be. Although the High Court in Lima protected the sister's ongoing possession until the local magistrate could conduct a swift investigation in the village, by the time several witnesses appeared before, to declare before the Spanish magistrate in Caraña a year and a half later, Diego Cajahuarco had passed and his interests were now represented by his widow, no other than Maria Camarca. In Maria's presence and at her own insistence, the Spanish magistrate called upon six male witnesses to help him adjudicate the case. Little did Maria know that her strategy would backfire. The men, most of them middle-aged, represented three of the 10 Ayus settled in Caraña, and they told the story from the late Felipe's, right, the sister's uncle, perspective. With death nearing, Felipe, who had no direct heirs and wished for his niece, Maria, right, Catalina and Angelina's mother, to inherit his property, his house, he had decided to draft the will. His original intention alerts us in passing, right, of his probable concern that his niece's rights uh, could be challenged, right, by more distant relatives and thus had to be shored up in right. Despite Felipe's initial wish, Diego Cajahuarco managed to persuade him on his deathbed not to name his niece as the sole beneficiary in the will, but to name him instead in exchange for 10 pesos. But people knew the truth, the witnesses declared. The exclusion of his niece was not because of lack of goodwill on the part of Felipe, but because he was not in his right mind and Diego, knowledgeable about legal matters, had taken advantage. The niece, on the other hand, according to the witnesses, was a single and lone woman, a mujer sola, who in the eyes of the witnesses had no one to speak up for her upon being excluded from the will. Faced with her own witnesses' damning testimony, Diego's widow, Maria Jamarca, had no choice but to declare, quote, to have no additional information to present on her behalf at this time, end of quote. And surprisingly, the Spanish magistrate found in favor of Catalina and Angelina, right, against Mari uh, Maria Jamarca, and issued a renewed deed. Um, as in all cases I've seen, Felipe's last will and testament was never entered in the record, into record and was ultimately ignored by all parties. The case was decided based on the witness testimony. Some three weeks later, on July 11, 1645, the town crier proclaimed through the streets of Carania that the sisters rights over the house, house lot, you know, and adjacent lands had been confirmed and should be upheld. Catalina and Angelina, the sisters, had won their case, securing the house and the fields for their descendants. But the dispute also left two clear losers. Diego Cajahuarco's widow, Maria Jamarca, whose claims via marriage to the homestead vanished with the court's ruling, and Felipe's much older widow, Catalina Ucho, who 10 years earlier had accepted the claim that the house in which she had once lived with her husband belonged now to her grandnieces. And it is unknown whether she was made to leave after the proceedings, though she's not mentioned in 1645. Widows like Maria and Catalina were particularly vulnerable within communal inheritance practices that, in the absence of male heirs, seems to have, seem to have favored daughters over wives. Different factors could ultimately sway village justice in unpredictable directions, possession of property deeds, in, the, in itself, right, did not guarantee a desired outcome, but written documents could help women like Catalina and Maria reassert their inheritance rights, as I've seen in other cases. As plaintiffs and defendants, who often got the short end of the stick, however, widows knew this only too 
well. So let me jump now to my conclusions. What can we sort of, uh, you know, take out of this, this, this village story? First of all, the custom could bring these women together, but it could also set them apart. Of course, many transfers of family heirlooms were not contentious. Many competing claims over family inheritance, moreover, must have been, must have continued to be resolved within extended family and IU frameworks, leaving no paper trail behind. This is why these court cases are so, so rare, right? One would expect that an ever larger number of disputes were also eventually removed from the municipal sphere and tried in distance, distant courts. But after the introduction of written titles, right, in these villages, periodic tensions regarding inheritance could now trigger litigation before the municipal court. Deeds enter the municipal sphere when a change of status, the prospects of marriage, or the death of a relative prompted women to call upon the courts to supersede or modify, but also to uphold customary rules regarding inheritance of family tracts and other resources. Privileging control by firstborns and male household heads, and uh, generally favoring sons over daughters, wives, and other potential heirs, seems to have been a widespread mechanism to protect agro-pastoral commons from claims by outsiders. Within this context, however, local custom uh, had helped commoners resolve these, these, these tensions, right? Um, but wills and similar documents can be seen in this context as sort of a written deviation, right? Even if a temporary one from oral custom have a real impact on the outcome of some of these, these, these cases. Municipal rulings for their part limited some women's ability to freely dispose of their share while guaranteeing other women access to household and extended family assets through inheritance, adoption, or marriage. As a result, by the mid 17th century, women villagers of the central Andes possessed an inherited land, disposing of it along with household plots and adjacent orchards, trees, and corrals. Reeds allowed wives, widows, sisters, and daughters to assert inheritance rights vis a vis men, but also in relation to other women, kin, and community members, giving them the necessary purchasing power, figuratively and literally, in the market of village lands. So the, courts, the court cases analyzed uh, in this presentation highlight the importance of locating new sources, which can help us bridge the gap between ideology and practice regarding gendered inheritance. Despite their novelty, these uh, limited and still spotty cases do not allow us to contrast pre-Hispanic and post-conquest custom with any degree of certainty, nor are these cases necessarily enough to replace prevailing narratives about the masculinization of the commons, this is Silvia Federici, right, with one of improvement or revitalization of colonial Indian women's rights to land for the period after the conquest. The cases do show, however, that gender relations were as much constitutive of kinship, community, and ownership as they were mediated by them, warning us of the risks of isolating gender ideologies and the inheritance practices that they underscore from other variables operating at ground level. The prevailing image of unidirectional change, right, and this possession of women over time now seems problematic, but no clear picture emerges from these cases to replace it, at least not yet. Players knew the rules, but they devised their own strategies for family and community reproduction based on them. The analysis suggests that colonial deeds adopted in the Central Indian region with some impetus in the early decades of the 17th century might as well have played an important role in strengthening commoner women's control over family assets inherited from other women and from their fathers and husbands via wills, property lists, and donations. Their most visible rivals in the courts, at least in the cases now being made known, were not men, but other women. The examples finally strongly suggest that rather than undermining women's rights to dispose of property, tightening and establishment of municipal courts and the expansion of the legal possibilities for claiming lands within this jurisdiction created opportunities for some of them to defend and enact those rights. The prerogative of widows and single women over 25 to file lawsuits without male guardians, for instance, is a likely explanation for the leading role that women and female-headed households took in these village-level cases, reinforcing the idea that their claims had been dismissed or were about to be dismissed in other more intimate kinship-based spheres. 
The preference for male parliament inheritance certainly marginalized certain women, but it also favored others. Iberian bilateral inheritance norms probably encouraged these engagements to contradict widespread custom, especially when other vehicles for redress had failed or weren't available. For the larger female segment in these rural settlements then, the impact of the written word on land inheritance seems to have been initially neutral. In the short term, technologies and practices often perceived as boring and detrimental to the place of colonial indigenous women within the community were also deployed by them to safeguard or expand their role in intra-family and intra-communal politics over the control of land and other assets. In the long term, the general adoption of tithing practices, even if still tempered by communal oversight, and the establishment of a jurisdiction to validate these titles by the municipality would weaken and in some cases fully erode communal control over key resources, detaching them from the commons. But my friends, that is another story. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing this with us, Jose Carlos. It is a true pleasure to get to hear about your work and to have the opportunity to see some of the materials with which you're working. So thanks to you and thanks again to our friends at the Lilly for facilitating that and making it possible to share those this way. So at this time, I will remind folks that if you have uh, questions or comments, you are welcome to share them in the Q&A spot that you have there hopefully appearing in the bottom of your Zoom window. Um, if for some reason you don't see that, you can put them in the chat and I will be happy to share those. Um, and while we're waiting to see if others who are here with us have any questions or comments to share, I'll just say, what are what are you envisioning as sort of next steps with this? Um, what are some other things that you either are planning or are hoping for this research or questions that you're still thinking about? Yes, that's a great question, right? Um, as, as I mentioned in the talk, I am now focusing on um, commoner women, right? Uh, which, as, as I also mentioned, have uh, been given much less attention, right, than uh, women of the elite, right, in both rural and urban settings. Um, but um, I'm also trying to think, right, how the picture would change if we were to um, include in the analysis, right? Um, some of the more elite women who uh, did not necessarily live in some of these villages, but certainly had many connections to them, right? Uh, so I'm also kind of looking for cases where the main protagonists are gonna be some of these elite women, but uh, in which perhaps they are litigating with um, Andean commons. Right, communities and sort of try to see, you know, what kinds of arguments are laid out in those cases to sort of oppose, right, individual rights uh, to communal rights, but all within, right, these sort of communal ethos that that limits really uh, people's possession, you know, entitled title to land. So I think that uh, you know, after kind of moving in the direction of governors, it would be also interesting to kind of go back a little bit and see see what. Uh, what uh, you know, uh, these other cases might might reveal. At the risk of asking a possibly unfair question, which you are perfectly uh, able to flag as unfair, are you aware of? Are there similar kinds of cases in other places or mm -hmm. other times um, where looking at? Uh, and what I'm thinking specifically is that this type of document is able to yeah. fill in the gap in this kind of way. Right, right. Now, that's a great question because it also takes us back to the issue of why, I mean, why they're so scarce, right? Why they're so difficult to find for the Andes. I have to say that for Mesoamerica, right, for New Spain, Mexico, these are not necessarily rare. I mean, there's lots of communal records, right, municipal records that scholars have been working with for, for decades now. In fact, many of them are uh, uh, written in the indigenous languages themselves, right? But for the Andes, uh, this has been sort of a puzzle. Right, that we've been trying to solve for decades now. Why is it so difficult to come up with these communal archives? And the reason might very well be that those communal archives that us historians envision based on some of the ordinances, right, that were issued in the 1570s and 80s, mandating, right, these villages to keep archives, that in many places those archives never really existed as such. And 
one of the additional reasons, right, why this particular document is so valuable is that you can see that the only reason, right, that these municipal cases were attached, right, to the larger court case was because some of the descendants, right, of the people originally involved, right, in the 1640s cases uh, had been litigating over the same lands. And so they basically were, um, were attaching family documents, family papers to these cases, right, to prove, to prove their arguments. So what I'm trying to say there is that once Maria Jamarca was done with her complaint, right, and once the judge ruled in her favor, she took the papers with her. They were not stored in some kind of archive that then historians can, can, can consult, right? So, I mean, uh, we're basically talking about private archives, most of which remain, uh, remain private, right? So this explains in turn why you come across some of them after you know years and years of looking for them, but they are not abundant. So I know one other case in Lima's National Library, again, two women fighting over land, uh, based on inheritance claims. Uh, and I know of another case uh, that is now uh, in the National Archives in Peru. So in the larger draft that I'm working on, I am integrating those two cases and sort of comparing them to the Carania cases, right, that we find in this particular, this particular dossier. But yeah, extremely difficult to, uh, to, to come across. I know, so the fifth one, right, is one in which um, yes, women are involved, but this is a case between two communities, two villages, right? It's not families, it's not individuals, but two villages, you know, fighting against one another for some land. So although those are municipal cases, I mean, the scale is very different, right? Because then the protagonist, right, is the village itself, all the Ayus, right, that live in that village, not the individuals like Maria Jamarca and others that were able to document in these cases, in, in, you know, in, in some ways for the first time. Thank you. We have a question from one of our attendees now. Della Cook asks, you mentioned only litigants identified as Indios. Yes. Is it unusual that mestizos and others were not participants? Mm -hmm. That's a great question, right? I mean, um, one of the most important findings, I would say, right, of legal history in the, in the last couple of decades is that um, many ordinances, right, many laws that were issued by the colonial government were never really enforced, right? Although we, 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 we take those laws as sort of the basis, right, for saying things about the past, it is very difficult to know to what extent they really, you know, inform reality, right? This famous gap between, you know, again, ideology and practice, you know, law and practice. So when it comes to mestizos, right, and other peoples living in these indigenous villages, they were not supposed to be there in the first place. Right now, that doesn't mean they were not found sometimes. Right, um, living in, in especially in the larger villages. Right, this Karani is a, is a small village, even for the for the universe of the Yaoyos villages. Right, they were much bigger villages that acted as sort of capitals. Right, of this particular province. So in this particular case, I haven't come across any mestizos, uh, but some of the names can be misleading because a lot of the last names are in fact Spanish last names. Right. Uh, but no, these are people who identified or were identified, right, or chose to identify for strategic regions, uh, reasons as indigenous. All the cases I am working with, right, again, at the village, municipal level, involve um, indigenous, indigenous uh, um, people. I've seen the accusation, right, of being a mestizo, but in other contexts, not so much cases regarding land, but regarding other issues, right? Where, you know, if somebody was in court, right, quote unquote, proven to be a mestizo could be disqualified, right, for, from, from certain things. But in the land cases I'm seeing, it's a very close meet, right? Um, reality where you have to be a member of the community in the first place in order to get access to these lands that your family can simultaneously claim as, as family land. No contradiction there, by the way. These are both individual and collectively held. Thank you. Um, you mentioned a little bit about the difficulty in tracing these items because it's unpredictable where they end up. They might be in private archives. They might be mm -hmm. in some sort of municipal archives. They might end up in an archive that's not private but is not in the location where 
the documents originate, as is the case with this. Um, could you say a little bit, and especially in case we have students or new archival researchers joining us or who watch this later, could you say a little bit about how you, you talked with me about how you found out even that the Lilly Library might have something of interest in the very first place and any sort of um, experiences or tips you have about doing, right. getting your foot in the door with this kind of research, I guess. Yeah, that's a great question too. Um, I mean, based on my experience, I would say there's only two ways, right? One is for um, whatever communal archives might be out there to be finally open to researchers, but that is difficult for many reasons, right? Some of which have to do with the very survival of the community, right? Choosing what you're gonna show, right, to outsiders uh, can be a very contentious issue, especially if that involves uh, issues of land, right, land tenure litigation and so on and so forth, right? So again, unlike the Mexican case, most communal archives, which we get a sense that, you know, date back to the 18th century, but rarely beyond that, right? Have not been open to researchers yet. So that would be one avenue for coming across uh, other municipal cases. Although the few documents I've seen from those archives are in fact, at a much higher level in the judicial system. We're basically talking about entire villages, again, entire communities that travel to Lima, right, to receive a title, right, for the community itself. But, you know, we might be able to, 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 to find, you know, a few municipal uh, court cases there. And then the second, right, avenue would be to look for cases like this one, which were tried, again, in Lima, Right, and they follow a very, you know, uh, sort of established pattern, right, where the court would receive the initial, you know, uh, complaint, would give the other party a chance to respond, and if they thought, right, that they should move forward, then they would um, summon the witnesses and, you know, let the parties make their case. Now, most of that stuff would not happen on site, but in many, in most cases, would happen in Lima itself, right? So it it, it removes you, right, from the specific setting of, of the village, uh, you won't be able to find, right, uh, families or individuals fighting each other for land because really if you're in Lima litigating and you wanted to present this sort of common front, right? The town is united. Nobody's, you know, there's no infighting, right? We're fighting another village, right, et cetera. So you won't get to that uh, uh, family and communal level. However, right, as I discussed today, Every once in a while, they would include these much older papers, these much older court cases that were indeed tried uh, in, the, in the local courts and later on added right to the process as evidence, as deeds. So much so that the other, um, one of the two other cases, right, that I know of that I haven't included in my talk, one of them, right, that's exactly what happened. It's uh, some land that gets litigated in Lima at the end of the 17th century. But in order to prove title to the land, they included right a uh, an older right 1612 1613 municipal dossier where um, again women right were fighting each other over over land. So I think again those are the, those will be the two avenues. One still closed to researchers. The other one keep an eye on uh, you know um, court cases involving land litigated in the in the in the high courts. Thank you. Uh, we have another question that's come in. It says, thanks to Jose Carlos for this interesting conference. I would like to ask if he considers that there's some contextual information such as demographic or tributary issues in the community or province that can be considered to understand the documents. Thanks and congrats to Jose Carlos. And that's from Carolina Gerardo. All right, well, absolutely, right? Uh, that's a great, uh, great observation. There are now, here, the, 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 uh, the challenge, right, is that you would have to find such, you know, types of information for the, the villages in question. In other words, I could present some information from either other villages or the province as a whole, but then that opens the question of how relevant, right, that information would be for understanding these micro level, right, disputes over land. Uh, we have some population numbers for the 18th century, for the 17th. There's only one inspection that was conducted in the late 16th century that gives you an idea of how many people lived in this town. 
But for, again, a place like Carania, right, just a random village in the central highlands of Peru, you won't, at least as far as I know, right, you're not going to come across a census, uh, something of that sort. Now, in some of these cases, right, the Carania ones, uh, you can almost sense the underlying conflict, right? Uh, who gets access to land depends on who is obligated to pay tribute. So the litigants would sometimes, right, allude in most cases in passing to these other issues, these other matters, right? That were sort of the backdrop to these cases. I just wish we had, you know, other sets of documents that would tell us more about, for instance, you know, um, um, household size, right? Uh, that would tell us about, you know, uh, perhaps rich and poor, right, villagers, who owns what, right? Uh, I haven't come across uh, those documents for the villages I'm, I'm focusing on. And again, it's not that I picked those villages, right? In some ways, those villages picked me because those were the cases that I was able to, to find. But it's a great question. The more you can correlate these land issues, right, with other things happening in the background, the better informed you're going to be, right, as a researcher to understand these cases. Keep in mind, too, based on, you know, Carolina's uh, really good observation that although these municipal cases end up being added, right, to litigation tried before the audiencia, when they were originally produced, they were not produced for an outside audience, right? These are, again, municipal records where people know what they're talking about. They don't really have to explain a lot of things because everybody knows, right, who these people are. We're talking about, you know, 200, 300 inhabitants. Everybody knows, you know, if their claims are true or not, if they paid their tribute that year. So a lot of things go unsaid and mentioned because, again, the audience, the original audience was never an outsider. Um, I've seen, for instance, in the case of Maria Jamarca, right, uh, um, the judge, Fortunately for us, right, the judge explains his ruling. He says, you know, I rule in favor of Maria for this and that, and he orders the different parties to do different things. But uh, another case I'm working with, right, the, um, uh, again, two women, the plaintiff makes her case, the defendant never responds. And she says that she's going to go to Lima, right, to really get her case. So when the judges have to uh, rule on that case, adjudicate, right? They don't really give you a reason, right? Why they're siding with the plaintiff, except to say that the defendant has not responded. But because of that, they don't, they don't explain the ruling, right? So we don't know what was in their mind, right? When we made that, that decision. So yes, the texts are important, but as Carolina is pointing out, the context is also um, extremely important. It's just that in some cases it's lacking for this village. It's just kind of a hit and miss. You might get lucky and then find, you know, more information on Karania, or you might never find anything else on, on this particular village. Let's hope that's not the case. Absolutely. And Della Cook has a follow-up question to that, yeah. which is, do you know whether there are baptismal records? Mm -hmm. uh, for this particular region, there are, but they're from the uh, 18th century not the 16th or 17th centuries. Um, so, I mean, that might push me, right, to kind of expand a bit, you know, the time frame of the study and include some of the decades of the 18th century so we get access to, um, uh, to that kind of information because that would reveal, for instance, you know, the different IUs that existed in the community uh, and other things, right, patterns of, you know, inheritance even, right? But uh, for this early, I mean, I guess, what I'm trying to convey here is that we would have known nothing about Carania in the colonial period, at least in the early colonial period, had it not been for these documents. It's not that you can go to an archive and then you know find an array of manuscripts pertaining to this village. No, in many cases, these records are the only evidence we have of what was going on there, right? So it's, it's a big sort of blind spot, if you will, but it's a difficult one to solve. Thank you very much. I am looking, I'm keeping an eye on it, see if we have any last questions or comments, but I think we've- That's the last word. <laughs> I, think, I think we have answered them all. And I'll just so speak much. for everybody and say, thank you so much for sharing your time and expertise with us. This has been fascinating. It's been such a pleasure to hear about your work and about um, particularly for those of us at IU, your work in the Lilly Library. So 
thank you again. And we wish you good luck as you continue with this project. And we look forward thank to you. hearing what's next and, and all the conclusions that you reach. So, thank you, thank you. The pleasure has been mine. Thank you very much, everyone. Yeah, and thank you again to our colleagues at the Lilly Library for both hosting you, being continuing great partners with us in this program and for helping to facilitate today's great lecture, which has been so enriched by getting to see the materials um, live and in person <laughs> while you can point to things. That's great. Uh, we really appreciate that. So for those of you with us, thanks for coming. And if you are interested in learning more about the repository um, research webinar series or other repository initiatives that we carry out here at the IU Institute for Advanced Study, please send us an email at ias at indiana.edu. And we can either point you to the right materials or add you to our mailing list. We would be happy to do either or both of those things. So thank you again. Good wishes to you all. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.